Hi everyone, Ian here from the Media Center, and in this video, I'll be covering how to set up the Red Komodo. The Red Komodo is a Super 35 6K cinema camera with a lightweight and minimalist design, and it captures in Red's industry-leading 16-bit Red Code RAW format and utilizes the same IPP2 color pipeline as Red's larger cinema cameras, such as the Monstro and the Raptor. This allows for enhanced image manipulation and flexibility in post-production, whether that be for VFX, high-end narrative film, documentary or content creators. The Komodo has different compression ratios to suit these different needs. The Komodo is able to capture up to 16 stops of dynamic range and uses a global shutter which scans the whole image at the same time as opposed to rolling shutter which scans the image in a sequential manner normally from top to bottom. This allows the Komodo to negate the jello effect in which straight lines can appear slanted during quick panning movements, and provides a better pixel readout which can allow for better dynamic range and exposure performance. Natively, the Komodo uses Canon's new RF mount, however we've adapted this to Canon EF which allows users to adapt and use a broad range of lenses including our Samyang and Canon Cine Primes. We've paired the Komodo with a tilter cage, and this also includes a side and top handle, which provides a multitude of mounting points. In addition, a quick release plate is also fitted, and two rail mounts allow matte box and follow focus systems to be easily installed, giving you the flexibility for building out or building down the rig. On top, the camera has a touch panel, which provides both menu control and a live display and controller buttons for physical navigation if this is how you prefer to operate. Across the right hand side of the body, the camera houses the power button, a record button, the fan extractor, and an antenna for wireless control via the RED control app. On the left hand side, the camera has a 3.5mm jack, headphone jack, fan extractor, and the CF card area. The Komodo uses CFast 2.0 cards, and you'll have two provided with the kit, both 512 gig. One should permanently be stored in the camera body, and the second is located in the camera bag side pocket. To the back of the Komodo, you'll find the battery mounting points, a mains DC power input, an SDI connection, and an EXT connection for external monitor control. Each battery is hot swappable, and six alongside their charger are provided in our bags. Included alongside the camera is a small HD focus OLED Pro external monitor. This will provide the operator with a larger viewing screen and full camera control is also available through a dedicated tab. The monitor is powered via Sony MPF batteries and two are supplied in the bag. To prevent circuit damage to the SDI input, it's ideal to use shielded cables and connect the cables in a certain sequence. Make sure any device or accessory is powered on before you attach the SDI cable. So, attach the monitor to the tilter top handle, then attach a battery to the monitor and power on the monitor. Once the monitor is powered, attach the SDI cable from the camera to the monitor. The small HD monitor can also have full camera control and this is enabled by connecting from the EXD cable to the USB monitor input. One side of the cable has 9 pins and the opposite side has 5 pins. The black 9 pin side must connect to the EXT port on the camera, whereas the yellow 5 pin side must connect to the USB port on the monitor. The red dot on the cable should align with the red markings on each connection point. Once connected, swipe to the monitor's camera control page and tap connect. The Komodo's main power brick also comes supplied in the bag and this can be used for mains powering the camera. This should be inputted into the DC in connection. Once the card, batteries and monitor and cables are installed and turned on, power up the camera. When initially turning on the camera, it may state that official batteries are not being used. We're using third party batteries, so click OK. And we've yet to experience any issues with these batteries. However, if any do occur, then please do let us know as soon as possible. The live homepage provides a viewing area for the image, your core exposure settings, 
and a range of critical camera information. The status bar provides various camera settings and inputs. Tapping the red logo moves between the live homepage and the main menu screen. The menu can also be reached by pressing the physical menu button. Tapping anywhere else on the status bar enables the status display. This is where you can see an overview for many of the camera settings, such as battery levels, card status, recording formats, lens information, Wi-Fi settings, and maintenance. Tapping on a drop-down arrow moves you to the settings dedicated area where further adjustment can be made. The CF icon confirms whether the card is mounted and ready to use, and also displays the remaining record time. The T temperature status area tells the operator if the camera's temperature is correctly optimized. When the camera is initially powered on, the T or E icon may appear as red or yellow. This means the camera is still heating up and adapting to its environment. If you record during this stage, the image quality may be compromised and may have additional noise across the image. The icons should turn both green in under five minutes, and once this has occurred, the camera is at the optimal temperature to record. If one of these icons stays on yellow or red, then the camera may need a black shade calibration performed. To perform this, press the menu button or tap the red logo in the status bar, select the maintenance page and choose calibrate. Now note, this should only be performed once the camera has reached its operational temperature, which should normally be around 10 to 15 minutes of the camera being powered on. In addition, the camera's mount cap needs to be attached when the calibrate function is performed, and this can be found in the camera bag. Black shading performs a black balance for the camera. This ensures clean and consistent pixel sensitivity across the camera's sensor, which reduces hot pixels and noise. The calibration window is where you'll select the type of black shade calibration to perform. You'll have two options in here, user and factory. If a black shading has never been performed, then only the factory option will be available, and this is what you should choose. Once an initial black shading has occurred, a user option will become available, and from this point onward, it's recommended by RED that you should always choose the user option. It's suggested by RED that calibration should be performed in the following settings. When shooting in an environment in which the temperature is significantly different from the previous black shade calibration, when there's a drastic change in exposure time, or after updating the firmware. Timecode, GenLock and Sync may be greyed out, however these are not needed for this general setup video. The 3D LUT icon displays to the user whether a 3D LUT is enabled, and as we can see, I currently have a LUT turned on in the camera, which is why it's highlighted in white. The tick icon shows the camera's status, whether it's good or bad, and when the lock icon is enabled, the LCD screen will be disabled to avoid settings being accidentally adjusted. To enable the lock function, press the up and down arrow together. When Wi-Fi is enabled and the correct settings are implemented, you're able to control the camera through the RED control app, and we'll look at this later in the video. Finally, the battery icon will display the battery level. However, because we're using third-party batteries, the battery icons will display a question mark, and instead you'll need to rely on the battery voltage meter, which is visible via the expanded status bar menu. Below the status bar, you have the live view page. From here, you'll be able to check the exposure and composition of your subject. You'll also be able to magnify the live viewing area to check critical focus and enable monitoring guides and tool aids, which we'll cover in more detail later in the video. The cam button acts as your digital record button. A physical record button is also located at the bottom left corner on the body's right hand side and when initiated, the icon will turn a brighter red, and when recording is stopped and the files are writing to the card, the icon will appear in yellow. Your core recording parameters are located along the bottom of the screen, and from here you can adjust the frame rate, ISO, the aperture, shutter, and finally the white balance. 
Entering these areas opens a scroll wheel which can be dragged up and down to alter each setting. As a starting point, we recommend your frame per second be set at 24 or 25 for real-time playback, 800 for your baseline ISO, 180 degrees for the shutter, and your white balance and aperture should be chosen around your own creative choices. The color temperature can be changed across 100 Kelvin increments. The ISO shutter and white balance can also be viewed and adjusted by going into the menu and selecting the image look window. If you'd prefer the shutter to be displayed as time as opposed to angle, this can be changed by navigating to the menu, system settings, status settings and shutter display mode window. 180 degrees is the same as 1 over 50 when shooting at 25 frames per second or 1 over 48 when shooting at 24 frames per second. A white balance list mode can also be adjusted from within this area. This allows you to set the white balance parameter as either Kelvin or preset. When Kelvin is selected, you can adjust the color temperature in 100 Kelvin increments at a time. If this is set to preset, then the white balance will display some common color temperature scenarios, such as incandescent, tungsten, fluorescent, and daylight. I find that presets gives me less control and adjustability across my image, so I'd recommend staying in the Kelvin mode. Another core exposure tool is the ND filter, and this is available via the EF adapter attached to the Komodo's RF mount. This is a variable ND filter, which ranges from one to nine stops and can be adjusted via the plus and minus roll wheel. ND filters reduce light input and this allows a user to retain their exposure triangle, i.e. the ISO, aperture and shutter across brighter scenes. Back on the live screen, the center panel provides recording information such as the clip name, resolution, aspect ratio, recording format and frame rate. Tapping in this clip information area also switches to a second page which displays an RGB histogram. The RGB histogram will show exposure for the separate red, green and blue pixels. However, it will not show where those pixels are within the scene. This histogram is better used as a quick reference point and will help to determine if any pixels are crushing below the shadows or clipping above the highlights. A more reliable way to determine exposure is via the traffic light exposure system and the false color scale. The traffic light system is designed around the red raw format and this is looking at the exposure levels from a raw sensor data perspective. The traffic light indicator is split into two sections, an overexposure column and an underexposure column. Each section splits the sensor's pixels into three separate channels red, green, and blue. A circular indicator sits at each end of the column, and when a circular indicator turns on, this is telling the user that there are some over or underexposed pixels within the frame. Now, this doesn't tell you where they are or how many pixels are affected, it's just giving you a warning that somewhere in the frame, some pixels may be fully crushed or fully clipped. For example, in this shot, you can see that somewhere in my frame, I have pixels that are underexposed because the circular indicators have turned on. Similarly, in this second example, you can see the opposite has occurred. Somewhere in my frame, I have overexposed pixels. This doesn't mean your image will look bad or that it's poorly exposed, but it does mean certain areas of the frame may not be retaining their full information so their full dynamic range. The real genius of the traffic light system are the columns. As your image becomes darker or brighter, the RGB columns will begin to fill up. These represent the quantity of pixels that are being under or overexposed. So the fuller these columns become, the more under or overexposed the image is. As I said earlier, the traffic light system is based on the red raw sensor data. This means it will only be affected when real physical changes of light occur across the image. What I mean by this is if I adjust the aperture, shutter, ND filter, or add and remove lights in the frame, the traffic lights columns will adjust. 
and that's because less or more light is able to hit the sensor when we adjust those parameters. A parameter that won't affect the traffic light system is the ISO, and that's because this is a digital adjustment which occurs in camera. It's not physical light hitting the sensor. This is because the ISO in a red camera has no relevance on the amount of dynamic range available. The camera can always capture 16 stops of dynamic range regardless of the ISO you selected. This is different to many other cameras which have a native ISO and deviating from the native will automatically reduce the dynamic range available. So for example, in this shot, you can see that my image is heavily underexposed. And as a result, my underexposure indicators are turned on and the underexposure columns are very full. Now, if I adjust my aperture, you'll see that the underexposure columns begin to reduce and the image adjusts to an acceptable exposure level. Similarly, if I adjust the intensity of the light in the scene and make it physically brighter, the traffic light columns also adjust accordingly. However, if I bring my image back to that original underexposed frame and close my aperture down and reduce the light input, and instead I adjust the ISO to make the image brighter, you'll see that although the image looks brighter on the LCD panel, the traffic light system's columns remain underexposed. And this means that pixels in the raw image data will not be optimally exposed. Because of this, it's important to expose your scenes correctly using the aperture, ND, and external lights, and make sure that the traffic light columns are not being heavily under or overexposed. ISO doesn't affect the image's raw sensor data. This means it doesn't bake in the exposure value of the red raw images, and this is because the ISO can be altered and remapped in post-production. So instead, the ISO adjusts where the 16 stops of dynamic range available in the camera sit, i.e. how many stops sit above middle grey and how many sit below middle grey. Unlike other cameras, in which the dynamic range will reduce when you move away from the native ISO point, in red cameras, every ISO value will use the full 16 stops of dynamic range from the sensor. This means there isn't one true native ISO in the Komodo, but rather every ISO is the native ISO. So every time you increase the ISO by a stop, for example moving from 800 to 1600 ISO, you redistribute a stop of light from below the middle grey point and place it above the middle grey point. This means as you increase the ISO, you'll have better highlight retention but less shadow detail. In contrast, every time you decrease the ISO by a stop, for example moving from 800 to 400 ISO, you redistribute a stop of light from above the middle grey point and place it below the middle grey point. This means as you decrease the ISO, you'll have better shadow detail and reduced noise and grain across those shadows, however your highlights will be more limited. This means that although the ISO won't bake its exposure values into the raw image, it will still affect the quality of the image. And although the ISO can be changed in post-production, the ISO value you select at the time of recording will still determine how much noise and highlight detail is visible. And this cannot be altered after the fact. So getting your ISO correct is still really important. The ISO will also still affect the brightness of the image being displayed across the LCD monitor, so it's important to ensure your ISO value is working alongside your monitoring and exposure tools. So how does this affect your workflow and how should you utilize the ISO? Well to understand this we need to know the primary way in which the Komodo measures exposure and this is through the traffic light system that I mentioned earlier. So in this scene, I've used the traffic light indicators to ensure the image is capturing all of the dynamic range available within this specific scene at a sensor level. And you can see this because I don't have any traffic light circles illuminated and the under and overexposure columns are not filling up. If I adjust my ND filters, you'll see that I can brighten or darken the image and the traffic light systems will indicate this 
and tell me whether pixels in the raw image are becoming over or underexposed. The histogram and image brightness level on the LCD screen will also adjust. And if I turn my false color scale on, you'll also see this adapts as I change the brightness range. If the image becomes too bright, the color red will appear and you'll see the overexposure indicators are also turning on across the traffic light indicators. And if I darken the image, the color purple begins to appear. And again, the underexposure indicators on the traffic light system are also present. Now, currently I have my ISO set at 800 and this is the recommended starting point suggested by RED as it provides the optimal ISO value for a lot of common shooting scenarios. And this is because it provides a good balance in terms of the stops of light available above middle gray and below middle gray. This means you should have good highlight retention and also good shadow detail with minimal noise across your images. Now this time, instead of adjusting the image brightness with the ND filters, I'll use the ISO. When the ISO is selected, the histogram and false color indicators will still adjust and the LCD screen will also still become darker or brighter. However, unlike before, when we adjusted the ND filters, the traffic light indicators won't change. This is because, as I mentioned earlier, on RED cameras, the ISO isn't altering the raw sensor data. And that raw image data is what the traffic light indicators are looking at. We can clearly see from the traffic light indicators that the image is poorly exposed at a sensor level. And this is going to introduce a lot of issues within the image, such as increased noise and crushed pixel points. Now, this is because the ISO is a digital adjustment, not a physical adjustment. And only physical adjustments on the Komodo will alter that raw sensor information. And when I say physical adjustment, I mean things which allow more physical light to hit the sensor. So the aperture, ND filters, the shutter, frame rate, and physical light changes in the real world. So because of this, you always want to ensure that first and foremost, you're measuring exposure correctly from the traffic light indicators. And as I say, in scenes which are well lit or scenes in which I can control the lighting, I normally do this with the ISO set at a starting point of 800. Once this is correct, I can use the false color scale alongside the traffic light indicators to determine where I want critical values to sit. For example, the middle gray point and the skin tone point. In this example, I've captured the same shot twice. In the first shot, the traffic light indicators are correct. The ISO is set to 800 and the image is sitting correctly across the false color scale. In this second example, the traffic light indicators are bad and incorrect, but the image still looks correct on the LCD screen and false color scale. And that's because I've compensated for the underexposure by increasing the ISO. But as you can see, the image is nowhere near as clean. This is why it's so important to work with and trust the exposure monitoring aids on the red Komodo. Now, if you've exposed the image correctly by using the traffic light indicators, but you've accidentally set your ISO value incorrectly and the image appears too bright or dark when it's brought into post-production, you still have the ability to alter the ISO from a metadata standpoint. Because as I've mentioned multiple times throughout this video, the ISO isn't baked into the raw file. And as long as the traffic light system is correct, your dynamic range across the image should be retained within the file. So for example, in this shot, I've recorded the same image twice, once with the camera set to 400 ISO and once with it set to 6400 ISO. Now we can see this because it's stipulated in the raw metadata of the source material in Premiere Pro. Now in this original state, the 6400 ISO image looks far brighter and really overexposed. And the 400 ISO image looks correctly exposed. And this is how they looked on the camera's monitor when I recorded them. However, even though the 6400 ISO image 
looks wrong from a screen monitoring standpoint. From a sensor data standpoint, the traffic light system was still indicating that exposure was correct, and the traffic light indicators were identical for both of these shots, and they were not showing any over or under exposure. Now because the traffic light indicators were showing correct exposure, it means that I should be able to remap the 6400 ISO back down to 400 ISO in post-production and retain the exact same amount of dynamic range. So what I'll do first is add a technical correction LUT to both images so you can get a better visual understanding of how the image changes. And here I've applied RED's log3g10 to rec709 conversion LUT. Now as expected, you can see the 400 ISO image looks correct when the LUT is applied, and the 6400 ISO image looks completely overexposed and washed out. And again, when I was capturing these images, I had the same overlay applied in the camera. And this is how the images looked on the monitor. When I changed the 6400 ISO image down to 400, you can see that it brings back all the detail and looks identical in terms of the dynamic range present. However, it's important to remember that because this image was set to 6400 in the camera, the highlight retention and noise threshold will be captured and baked in based on the ISO value you've set. This means that the 6400 ISO image will have more noise and grain visible in the shadows when compared to the 400 ISO version, even if it's remapped to the same ISO value in post-production. So, use the ISO to determine whether you need cleaner shadows or more highlight retention, and that will be entirely dependent on your shooting environment and your own shooting preference. If I were filming in an environment with lots of shadow information and minimal highlights, I'd be choosing a lower ISO value such as 400, or even at times 250 to reduce the noise and grain. Similarly, if I felt that I wasn't able to retain my highlights at 800 ISO, then I may at times adjust to 1600 or 3200 ISO. However, 3200 would be my limit as I feel going above this would introduce too much noise for my personal taste. Remember, you should always aim to expose your raw image as perfectly as possible in the camera. And that means you're gonna to have to do less post-production work to fix any issues. In addition to the traffic light system, we can also use a false color scale to get critical exposure. This, as well as additional tools and guides can be accessed by tapping on the traffic light icon and a second page will appear. From here, you can turn on and off the guide and tool overlays for either the LCD screen on the camera or the SDI signal being fed to an external monitor. When enabled, a green marker will be present. The magnify button will digitally magnify into the frame and the LCD screen is touch enabled so you can move the magnification throughout the frame. If you choose the SDI for magnification, then your external monitor will magnify. However, you'll still adjust the magnification point by touching and dragging on the camera's LCD screen. When the guides tab is turned on, your frame guides and center guide markers will become visible. These parameters can be adjusted via the menu, monitoring and guides tab. When the tools tab is turned on, the edge, peaking, focus, exposure and video tools become accessible. These will appear in the live viewing area and can be adjusted and customized via menu, monitoring and tools tab. Edge, peaking and focus relate to focus. Exposure and video relate to false color exposure and the zebras also relate to exposure reflectance. False color provides a range of colors for different exposure levels within the frame. You have two options for false color, exposure and video mode. Exposure mode is looking at the raw image data, i.e. the flat log image. When exposure mode is selected, most of the image will appear as monochrome. The false color will then indicate where middle gray is falling, and this will appear in green. If the color red is visible on the false color scale, this means the area is likely overexposed, 
if the color purple is visible on the false color scale, this means the area is likely underexposed. The exposure false color provides a smaller range of colors to concentrate on, and this allows you to create an optimal balance between how much of the frame is overexposed and clipping or underexposed with grain and noise present. The exposure false color scale should be used when the LCD screen or external monitor is viewing the red raw R3D color gamut. To set this up correctly, the monitoring look settings should be set to RWG log 3G10 in both the LCD and SDI parameters. Alternatively, video false color should be used when the LCD or SDI monitoring look are set to image slash LUT and overlaying the output color space or 3D LUT on the camera's LCD screen or external monitor. This video false color scale is based on the RGB levels of the LUT, not the raw log image. This false color scale will utilize the traditional false colors. Green is where you'll want an 18% middle grey card to sit, and pink is typically where Caucasian skin tones sit. Darker skin tones will sit closer to the green middle grey point. Straw, yellow and orange indicates bright highlights which are getting increasingly closer to white and clipping, while teal represents textured shadows. Blue means the area of your frame is close to untextured black, and purple means you're losing all detail in the darkest parts of the frame. The peaking tool gives the user different options for gaining focus. Focus means that the camera will use enhanced contrast and sharper edges for aiding in focusing, while peaking places colored lines across the area of the frame in focus. Personally, I find these focusing aids more difficult to use on the Komodo, so I personally prefer to use the edge function. Edge will place a white outline on the focused area in the frame, while the rest of the frame will remain black. This means focusing is much easier across a variety of lighting environments due to the high contrast of the focusing tool. Your zebra levels can also be turned on from this window and will appear in either red or green depending on which you select. The IRE value of the zebra levels, as well as other tools, can be additionally altered via the menu, monitoring and tools tab. From here, each zebra can set a high and low IRE, allowing the user to control the threshold of when the zebra lines appear. In the peaking tab, you can also adjust the color of the peaking function and the line's intensity. The false color area simply lets you switch between the exposure and video mode the same options of which we've already looked at. And when the log view option is enabled, this will disable any LUT and showcase only the flat red white gamut color profile. Additional options in the guide tab are frame guides and the center guide. The center guide provides a cross or dot overlay for helping with central composition, while the frame guides let the user input aspect ratios. From here, you can select your standard square ratio, HDTV ratio, the modern theatrical ratio, IMAX, or theatrical widescreen. Custom aspect ratios can also be created within this window, while the line style, color, and opacity can also be adjusted. Also located in the monitoring window are the LCD and SDI monitoring tabs. These refer to how the SDI and LCD ports will showcase and monitor your image. Tools, guides and magnification can be turned on from both areas, and prism mode should be disabled as it will flip the screen and disable the touch panel. Within the SDI tab, you can also adjust the resolution and frame rate frequency. These should be set at or as close to the monitor's screen resolution and the frame rate the camera is capturing at. An overlay can also be turned on, which sends a Komodo's display information to the external monitor. Simple will provide very basic information, which is less obtrusive, whereas advanced mode will provide the user with more exposure and recording information. As I've previously mentioned, the look option is available in both the LCD and SDI tab. If this is set to image slash LUT, then the output color tone and 3D LUTs will be present across the screen. 
If this is set to RWG log 3G10, then a flat log image will be present. And that pretty much breaks down the exterior of the camera and the main live viewing panel. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out part two, where I'll take a deep dive into the camera's full internal menu structure. So until next time, keep shooting, keep being creative, and we'll see you soon.